الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إياك نعبد صلى الله عليه العظيم وقال الله تبارك وتعالى في شأن هبيبه مخبرا وآمرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد كما تحب وترضى لك أن تسلم عليه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أيضا تفسير سورة الفاتحة we have covered what is the definition of Hamd and what the scholars have said in regards to Hamd and the definition of Rabb and Alameen in this discussion and the Sifat of Allah which are Rahman and Ar Rahim. Now we begin the discussion of Iyak al Abdul. And the ulama they write that it's quite amazing how Allah Ta'ala does itifat. And there is a qaida of balagha, ilmul balagha of rhetoric, where the ulama say that this is sanatul iltifat. Sanatul iltifat basically means that when a person, he changes the address that he's talking to. For example, I speak to you in the first person, and then I change and I speak to you in the third person, and then I change again and I speak in the first person. And then I change again, I speak in the third person. This is called Sanatul Iltifat. And Allah Ta'ala has done Sanatul Iltifat in Surah Al Fatiha. And Mufassirin say that in the beginning ayahs of Surah Al Fatiha, Allah Ta'ala is talking in the third person, He's talking in the Ghaib. When He says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, He's not addressing us here, but He's talking to us in the third person. He is not doing khitab towards us. He says, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And then he talks about his Sifat Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And this is also in the third person, and this is in the Ghaib. Allah Ta'ala is talking in the third person. But then when it comes to his Ibadah, he addresses us and talks to us in the first person. And he says, Iyaka Na'budu. And then he uses these pronouns and these verbs of Khitab, i.e. he addresses us. And the scholars say that the benefit of Iltifat, the benefit of changing from one tense to another tense and the benefit of changing to one person and to another person gives the fa'idah of uh, tanbih and tanbih basically means Allah Ta'ala wants us to make us mutanabbih here that He wants to make us aware and He wants to wake, wake us up here and He's trying to tell us that Iyaka na'budu that my ibadah is only for me i.e. the worship of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala that individual is mustahik who is deserving of the worship of Allah is Allah Himself and no one else. Hence, why Allah Ta'ala has now changed the address and how He's going to address the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Iyaka na'budu. The word ibadah, Mufassirin have said, and Alama ibn al Munzur al Afriqi, who is an authority when it comes to Arabic language, in his famous book, Lisan al Arab, he mentioned that the definition of ibadah which we loosely define as worship, what it actually means is that an individual, he becomes so arduous and he becomes so inkisal, i.e. he humbles himself and then he does the obedience of Allah. So this is the definition of ibadah, that an individual, he brings upon himself this state of inkisal and arduity, and he brings about this state of khudu, of humility upon himself, and then he does the itaah, the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what most of a majority of the mufassirin are written when it comes to the definition of ibadah. And the definition that they give of this, or the example, sorry, that they give of this is the, is the sajda, the prostration that we do in our prayer. And they say that this is ibadah. But there's an objection upon these examples made especially by in Ziyar Quran by Bima Amr Karam Shah Razhari Rahimahullah Ta'ala and they say that how is it that sajda can only be ibadah and Kibla Peer Sahib they say that all the harakat and the sakanat of salah they are all part of the ibadah so why have the mufassirin now made it khas, made it specific that only sajda means that this is the worship and the ibadah of Allah 
and they, the ulama, they write that if you were to look at the prayer, all the actions and the rituals of the prayer, every single thing from takbir tahrima to the salam, all of us will agree that this is all ibadah. And no one will say that just the sajda is ibadah. And no one will say just the latter part of the salah, i.e. being the sajda, that that only comes under the definition of worship and ibadah. But we will accept that every single one of us will accept and there's no ikhtilaf upon this, that from takbir tahrima when we say Allahu Akbar, all the way till we, all the way till the end, till we say assalamu alaikum, we will all agree that this comes under the definition of ibadah. That every single ritual and rukun of the prayer comes under the definition of ibadah. I.e. when you are standing and you in the qiyam of Allah, this is the ibadah. When you are in jalsa, this is the ibadah. When you are in sajda, this is the ibadah. When we are in ruku, this is the ibadah. When we are reading at tahiyyat, this is ibadah. When we are reading the Surah Al-Fatiha, reading the Qira'ah, this is ibadah. And every single harakat, every single movement, every single sakalat of salah, those positions where we are stationary, every single one of them falls under the category and the definition of ibadah. And this is something that we all accept. And then ulama, they carry on and they explain that if all of these acts, ruku, bowing, prostrating, standing, qiyam, all of these are done outside the prayer, are they regarded as ibadah? And the mufassirin have said that no. No one will accept that if a person stands up for another individual that he is doing his ibadah. And no one will say that when a person is in ruku, but he's not in the state of salah and he just does ruku to someone, no one will say that this is ibadah. Why? Because what becomes ibadah is your itikad upon that individual. What do you, do you believe about that individual? For example, sajda in the sharia of the Prophet wasallam is haram. It's not allowed. And Imam Ahmad Rida Khan wrote a full book against those individuals who worship because there is a time, there is a Objection, especially on the Sunnah wal Jama'ah, especially those from uh, Hindustan, especially for those area of Pakistan and India, that we are people that we worship the graves and we are regarded as great worshippers. And these, this is especially uh, mansoob towards Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. But he was an individual who was free from this and his school and his ideology and the ideology of ulama before him. We were all free from this and this is the whole ideology of Ahl-Sunnah wal Jama'ah that he wrote a whole book in defense of Ahl-Sunnah wal Jama'ah that we are people that do not do worship or sajda to a grave because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had made it haram for the, his ummah to do sajda to anyone. When that person came, Qadi Ayaz, he mentioned this narration in Al-Shifa that an individual came to the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and he asked the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasalam to perform a miracle in front of him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did so and that person, he, cut, he kissed the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he kissed the feet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is in me he said, give me permission that I do sajda to you the Sahabi asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is in me Give me permission that I do sajda to you. And the Prophet ﷺ said that if anyone was to do sajda to anyone in my ummah, I would make it wajib upon the wife that she do sajda to her husband. But the Prophet ﷺ said that this act is mamnu, is haram, and it's not allowed within our sharia. So when we are standing up out of qiyam and out of ihtiram for an individual, or we kiss the hands of an individual, or we stand out of respect, or we sit uh, on our knees out of respect, like Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam sat in front of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam to the extent that the Rabbi says, ila rukbatay, ila rukbatay, that the knees of the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu salam and the knees of Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salatu salam were touching one another. This is not ibadah, but this is ta'zim and tawqeed, like I mentioned today in Jum'ah that we do not worship the Prophet If an individual believes that Rasulullah is his ma'bud, he is khalid from the deen of Islam. We do not believe that the Messenger of Allah is deserving of worship. We believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one who is worthy of our worship and we honor and we respect and we revere 
the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wassalam in highlight of the verse of the Quran وَتُعَزِّرُوهُ وَتُوَكِّرُوهُ that Allah Ta'ala says honor Rasulullah alayhi salatu wassalam and respect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wassalam and all of the the two three circumstances and scenarios that I mentioned in Jum'ah especially in regards to the Sahaba that when Urwa bin Mas'ud came and was sent by Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl and the Quraysh at that time to go and observe how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and how the companions are and when the Sahaba were catching the droplets of wudu that were touching the body of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and they were catching the saliva وَقَادُوا يَقْتَتَلُونَ عَلَيْهِ as Imam al-Bukhari said that so much so, so they, would, they would begin to fight amongst one another for the water that had touched the blessed body of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to the extent that you know, Umar bin Mas'ud said I was afraid that they were going to kill one another just for the water and the droplets that touched the best body of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and all these acts which the Sahaba did they were out of ta'zim their i'tiqad, their belief was at that time that we are doing this not with the niyyah, with the intention of ibadah but with the intention of ta'zim, out of respect and to do things out of ta'zim for other people is jaiz with the sharia of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a lot of people have an issue and they all say that tell me where it's mentioned in Bukhari but well, I'll tell you something about Imam al-Bukhari that will surprise you that Imam Muslim was the student of Imam al-Bukhari and Ibn al-Hajr al-Asqalani in his first volume of the Shara written on Sahih al-Bukhari the most authentic Shara which is written on Bukhari is called Fathul Bari and in the first volume in the Muqaddimah in the preface when Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani discusses the life of Imam al-Bukhari he says that Imam Muslim was his student and when Imam Muslim would see Imam al-Bukhari he would say Da'ni an ukabbila rijlaika ya ustaz al ustazi he would say that give me permission that I kiss your feet O ustaz of ustaz this was the i'tiqat of Imam Muslim that he had for Imam al-Bukhari and this is mentioned in the first volume of Fatwa al-Bari in the Muqaddimah anyone who has an issue with this narration can go and look at Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani now one thing that needs to be bear in mind that we need to bear in mind that if kissing the feet of another individual with the intention of ta'zim was wrong that Imam al-Bukhari would have prohibited that individual to do so but he didn't and this was the belief of Imam Muslim that kissing the feet of a teacher is jayz and permissible so this is the difference between ibadah and ta'zim ta'zim is done for the messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam for the Sahaba, for the Ulama, and Ibadah is something which is khas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Ulama have written that Allah ta'ala said in Surah Al-Fatiha, Iyaka na'abudu. He didn't say na'abudu ka, but he said Iyaka na'abudu. Now, the Ulama, they write that why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought Iyaka before its place? Certain things, Iyaka here is becoming the object in this verb. Na'budu is the verb and the subject. The way a jumla fi'liya, a verbal sentence, works within the Arabic language is that the verb comes first, then the fa'il, the subject, comes first, and then the object comes first. But in Surah Al Fatiha, the object has come first, then the verb comes, and then the fa'il comes. So that thing which was meant to come after has come before. That thing which was meant to be mutta'akhir has become muqaddam now, has come before and the ulama said the fayda that this gives the benefit that this gives, it gives the benefit of hasr i.e. iyaka na'budu means that ya Allah only you are mustahik of ibadah hence why iyaka was born before na'budu this gives the meaning that ya Allah only you are worship of ibadah and no one else and the reason why Allah didn't say na'budu ka the ulama said the reason why Allah said na'budu didn't say na'budu because this could give the meaning that we worship you, yes Allah, but then we worship someone else. But Allah Ta'ala didn't say this. He said, Iyaka na'budu. Now this, when we translate this, and when we understand the meaning of Iyaka na'budu, this can only mean, Ya Allah, we only worship you. I No one else can be worshipped except for you. And this is one of the, the reasons why ulama said that Iyaka was born before the actual fear, the verb and the subject. And they say that, Another reason, and this is something to do with the Tasawwuf, which they write that why it was bought before, is because in Iyaka Na'abudu there are three things. One is 
abid. One is ma'bud and one is ibadah. Ibadah is the fi'l, is the verb, worshipping. And then the abid is the subject, the one who is doing the worshipping, i.e. the makhluq of Allah. And the ma'bud is the person who is being worshipped, that is known as the object. I, Allah Ta'ala, we do our ibadah for the sake of Allah. So the Mufassirin and the Sufiyah, they were actually amazing. They said, why did Allah Ta'ala say, Iyaka na'buna? He said, because those men of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, the first thing that comes into their mind is Allah, then comes their ibadah. I, when they are worshipping Allah, they are thinking about Him first. They are not thinking about their ibadah, and nor are they thinking about themselves, the abid, but they are thinking about the ma'bud, and they always think about the ma'bud. And hence why the Fasirin give the example and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam, and asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَأَخْبِرْ مِي عَنِ الْإِحْسَانِ That tell me what is ihsan. And the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam said, ihsan is that, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّهَا تَرَى فَإِن لَمْ تَقُمْ تَرَى فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاك That if Ihsan is that thing that you worship Allah as if you are seeing Him فَإِن لَمْ تَقُمْ تَرَى فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاك If you are not at that level that you when you worship Allah that you can't see Him then remember when you are praying Allah Ta'ala is seeing you and ulama have written that there have been people that have existed in our tarikh and in our history that when they are praying, they have forgotten their ibadah and they have forgotten themselves and the only thing that they remember is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this also existed in the time of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wa salam, Sayyidah Aisha. She said, I came home one day and I did not find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I got worried and I went to see where the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam is. And I found the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam in front of the Kaaba and they were in sajda and they were in sajda for so long that I feared that Rasulullah has passed away from this dunya. So I, when I became closer and I pro- approached the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah heard my footsteps. The Prophet said, Man ant, who is there? Who are you? I said, Aisha said that, Ana Aisha ya Rasulullah. Ismi Aisha ya Rasulullah. The Prophet said, Man Aisha. Who is Aisha? Sayyidina Aisha said that I became worried. And I said, Aisha bint Abi Bakr, Ya Rasulullah. That I am Aisha, the daughter of Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq. The Messenger of Allah replied, Man Abu Bakr. Who is Abu Bakr? Sayyidina Aisha said that I replied, Abu Bakr ibn Abi Quhafa, Ya Rasulullah. That I am the daughter of Abu Bakr, and Abu Bakr is that individual who is the son of Abu Quhafa. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam read, Man Abu Quhafa, who is Abu Quhafa? I said, Aisha, she said that I realized and I became worried and I became scared that this moment for me is not appropriate that I stay here any longer. She said, I returned home and the Prophet said, after a short while came back home and then I asked the Prophet Ya Rasulullah I came to you and you didn't recognize me. And then I told you about my father and you didn't recognize me. Then I told you about my grandfather and you didn't recognize me. And you asked who are these people and who am I? And the Prophet ﷺ replied, Ya Aisha, li ma'allahi waqtun. That, oh Aisha, there is a time for me, but it's just me and Allah, and I've forgotten the rest of the dunya. This was the state of the namaz of the Prophet ﷺ. And there were certain awliya of this ummah that existed, that when they are doing the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they forget their ibadah, and the only thing that they can see in front of them is the wajh and the jamal and the tajalliyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they forget their own hal and they look at the jamal. Like the women of Misr, when Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam entered the, uh, the room and the women of Misr, they began to cut their fingers and at astonishment and look at the jamal of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. They looked at the mere beauty of Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam and they forgot their own state, their hal was such a hal that when they looked at his beauty, they began to cut their fingers and they didn't realize that their fingers had been cut. And these are states that people get into. And hence, Prophet Sirin, they say, the reason why Iyaka came before Na'udu was this reason that when a person prays, he just remembers Allah and he looks at the Jamal and the Kamal and the Tajalliyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And other reasons scholars have given that why Iyaka came. And another reason ulama said that Iyaka came so that an individual, the first thing he does is that he remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when Allah ta'ala gives him, that gives him a ni'mah, when Allah ta'ala bestows a blessing upon him, he doesn't look at the blessing, but he looks at the mun'im. He looks at the one who gave the blessing. And when Allah takes away that blessing, he is not worried or concerned because he is always worried and is always the wajjo. His face is always turning not towards the blessing, but is turning to the one who gave that blessing. And he is not worried about if that blessing is taken away from him. Hence, when a person is in musibah, the certain awliya of Allah, when they are in musibah, they are not worried and they are not, they do not become restless because they always look and their intija and their tawajjuh is always to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence, when Ghalib, I think it was Sali al Sakati, his son, when he passed away, the people of that time of Sali al Sakati, who was a great scholar and a great man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they said in his entire life he never saw Sali al Sakati ever smile. But the day his son was taken away from him, the day his son passed away, he smiled. He smiled at the funeral of his son. And when people questioned him and asked him, why is it that at this occasion you are smiling and at the occasion in your life when you were meant to be smiling, you never smiled in your entire life. This is the first time you've seen you smiling. But this is not the appropriate occasion for you to be smiling. Why is it that you are smiling? They asked him and Sayyid Sakrati replied, he said, the reason why I'm smiling because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my son was beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah ta'ala called my son back to him and I'm happy with the decision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these people their entire life, they don't look at the, the sifat or the zat or, or the material things of the dunya, what is being given. They don't look at their family. They look at the one who has given them that family. And they look and that tawajjuh is always to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is from the secrets of the ulama. They mentioned why Allah ta'ala said iyaka before he said na'budu. And he didn't say na'budu iyaka. And nor did he say na'budu ka. And this is one of the secrets of this. That when, and we see this in the lives of the Sahaba and the Shahid, he once said that namaz tere nazare ka bahana hai. That we only pray so, and the prayer, he said the prayer is an excuse. Namaz tere nazare ka ik bahana hai. The prayer is only an excuse so that we can be your didar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prayer is only a sabal. The prayer is only a means, but the destination is that we see your jamal and we forget our hal. We see your jamal and we see your kamal and we see your tajalliyah and we forget our ibadah, we forget ourselves. And all we see is you and all you see is us. Hence when the Messenger of Allah said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّهَا تَقْرَنَّكَ تَرَى That you worship Allah as if you are seeing Him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would not have said this if men from his ummah weren't at that level that when they pray they can see Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And if this is the maqam of the awliya Allah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the awliya of the ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then what is the maqam of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself? When he led all the Anbiya alayhi salam in prayer in Masjid al-Aqsa, what kind of namaz would that have been? When all of the Prophets of Allah from Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, all the way to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, are standing in the safuf and Rasulullah alayhi salatu salam is leading all these Prophets in prayer. What is the state of that prayer? Iyaka na'budu. And this is one for one of the reasons why Iyaka was, Iyaka was born before. And just to finish on a story of that these Things also happened in the time of the Sahaba. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. He was in a battle and a spear was pierced inside him. And the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala an ajma'in said that it was so difficult, uh, difficult for us and it was unbearable for Sayyidina Ali that that spear be taken out. So Sayyidina Ali said that when I am in prayer, then take that spear out. So Sayyidina Ali, he offered two rak'ah nafr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he did salam, he turned around and he asked the people, have you taken the spear out? And they said, yes we have, didn't you really? He said, I did not realize. This was the namaz of Sayyidina Ali, that a spear was inside him and that spear was taken out. But his hal, his state in that prayer was such that he forgot every single thing around him. And the only thing that he could see of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hence when that spear was taken out, he did not feel any effect. And this is the whole purpose of ibadah. 
And this is why the men of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they write that the, when a person is praying, when he said, Allahu Akbar, why does he raise his hands like this? Because he is pushing the dunya away, and the only thing he sees in front of him is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is from the secrets of Iyaka Na'budu. And this is what the ulama have said in regards to the explanation of the short little ayah. Next week I will carry on and we will continue Iyaka. Uh, and we look at isti'ana and this is a very important issue especially today isti'ana whether we can seek help from other than Allah and what is the correct stance and the mawqib of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah and especially the ulama of Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah of those ulama who were pastors in the history of these last 14 centuries may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq that we become those people that when we pray to him we see him in our prayers wa aquli qawli hadha wa astaghfiru Allah li wa lakum وآخر معوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين أمن اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى سيدنا ومولانا محمد كما تحب ورغالا بأن تصلي عليه ربنا تقبل منا إنك رب السميع العليم نطبع علينا إنك رب التواب الرحيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما وزدنا فحما وزدنا حكما والحمد لله على كل هاب نصل الله على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أمين برحمتك يا رب